Hi guys, hope you're all keeping safe and well. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about motoring Middle East, but also about what I was doing before motoring Middle East and what I'm doing now. We'll also be touching on the time I shared a car with a very famous motoring journalist. No, not that one. Anyway, before I get into that, make sure that you're subscribing to youtube.com forward slash brown car guy. Make sure you're following me on all the social media channels. Just search for hashtag brown car guy. You can see it on my hat there. Uh, that's on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And of course, subscribe to browncarguy.com. Well, let's get into this. This should be interesting. A couple of days ago, Motoring Middle East, which is a automotive news media channel uh, across uh, YouTube and social media platforms, but based in Dubai, celebrated its ninth birthday. Now, why is that significant, especially to me? Because in 2011, along with Imtishan Giado, I co-founded MME, as we came to call it. Except I didn't. I didn't found it, so to speak. Not really. You did. Well, not you, you. Although perhaps actually you, no, no, not you, but you and her and definitely that guy over there. See, I moved to Dubai in 2006 to be editor of Car Magazine. I mean, freaking Car Magazine. It's one of the grandest, most prestigious, literally the most storied uh, motoring magazine on the planet. It's the magazine that gave us the late great motoring journal LJK Setright, who, as legend goes, coined the very phrase supercar when he simultaneously pioneered the drive story by driving a Mura from the uh, Lamborghini factory to the UK. Not all of that is entirely true, I think, but it's how the story is best told. Plus, Carr does claim to have created both and also, by the way, claims to have created group tests as well. I do actually have an LJK set right story. Should I tell that now? What? Oh, okay, go on then. So, it must have been back in 2000 or 2001 and I turned up late, uh, a bit late to a Mercedes media drive. I think it might have been this, a new C-Class. I guess it was a less, than memorable, um, than, less memorable than the actual experience that I'm about to relate. But somehow I do remember that I drove a Ford Puma there and back because that was quite a hoot. Anyway, I got there late, as I mentioned, and the drivers had already paired up uh, in most of the cars. So one of the PR people asked me, um, somewhat apologetically was it no I think forebodingly well anyway he asked me if I would mind pairing up with Mr. LJK Setright holy moly goddamn LJK Setright this guy was like a superstar in automotive media I'd get to meet him spend time with him maybe learn something watch him do what he does to put it into context for some of you guys, it would be like turning up to a drive event and being asked if you wouldn't mind sharing a car with Jeremy Clarkson Plus, I loved Hondas, and Serrite loved Hondas. He owned them, in fact. He was one of the few British motoring journalists that didn't have a stuck-up Kenneth Williams nose when it came to Japanese cars, and who wasn't instantly biased or prejudiced because a car wasn't European, which during his era would usually mean it was unreliable, or British, which during his era was, well, worse, much worse in some cases. Anyway, uh, perhaps because it was uh, that he was Jewish, so uh, a minority, that maybe that's why he was a little bit more open-minded. He was certainly less conventional. He was very, very less conventional, in fact. Anyway, I figured it would be very interesting to talk to him about stuff. So I nodded, a little in surprise, a little in excitement, and uh, something else. A little in anxiously, perhaps. No, I mean, you know, it would be like, um, say, if you found yourself uh, on an airplane sitting next to the late great President uh, Nelson Mandela, who was in the mood to talk, and you'd be like, how do I keep up with this great man intellectually? You'd be turning to the air hostess and say, I'm going to need coffee on tap. Just keep it coming because you're going to need it. That's what that would be like, right? And then there he was. Mr. LJK set right, imposing as anything. He was a tall guy, I reckon taller even than me, and I'm six foot two. Very slim, lanky, always impeccably attired with a Gandalf-like beard, uh, plus a skull cap. 
Now check out his wiki and on there it actually says is that he's been described as a gaunt Old Testament prophet in Savile Row clothes and that's pretty apt. So I asked him uh, would you like to take the first in behind the wheel, sir? <laughs> I spluttered out rather pathetically. I was starstruck. Uh, no, old boy, you go ahead, or something like that. That was his response. You know, he was um, old school, uh, old school etiquette and eloquence. You know, he was like that. So I drove this Mercedes on a press drive like I was taking my bloody driving test. You know, all correct, uh, 10 to 2 hand position on the wheel, mirror signal maneuvers and, you know, shuffling the wheel. You know, bear in mind that I'd probably already been driving for a decade and a half by this time. So that's, you know, that's how long ago I would have passed my test. But anyway, you're, you know, you're sitting next to the master, literally the guru, and you suddenly become very self-conscious. What I didn't realize is that he probably didn't give two hoots. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't. And there's something else that I didn't realize either. Halfway down this route, and almost with uh, some considerable relief at not having made any kind of driving blunder, but also not really knowing what the Mercedes was actually like because I was focusing so hard on my driving. Ah, of course, that's why I don't even have a recollection of what the car was or what I drove. Anyway, I, I finally got to hand it over to Mr. LJK Setright. He got into the driving seat, adjusted the seat and the mirrors, and, well, I think the alarm bell started ringing when slowly and with theatrical flourish, he started to pull on a pair of springback driving gloves. Then he went from this uh, deliberate, methodical, considered preparation to suddenly slamming the gearbox into drive and flooring it like an all-action getaway driver. And he pretty much stayed on it for the whole rest of the way. Utter nutter. Mental hooligan. He was fast. Damn fast. But not fast like when you're sat beside a, uh, a professional driver who's so smooth and so precise that you're perfectly at ease bec because uh, despite the pace you know you're in safe hands no no this was like well let's just say my eyes were popping out on my head my jaw was flapping around on my chest and i definitely left an imprint of my hand on the passenger uh, door grab handle during this drive i rediscovered god and even as a muslim i'd have converted to judaism uh, then and there if he demanded it and and confessed to sins that i couldn't even have conceived you know <laughs> Later on, when uh, I got back to the office and my colleagues uh, finally you know, picked themselves off the floor when they'd stopped laughing um, at my experience, uh, they rightly pointed out that I should have pondered why no one else had already partnered with Setright when I got there. Apparently, he's quite notorious for this. The guy drove without fear, without fear of death specifically, believing that when it was his time, it would be his time. Well, that's fine, but what about my time? <laughs> anyway, so somehow we didn't crash and die that day. We completed the route and got back just in time for a spot of tiffin. Although, frankly, my appetite had escaped my tummy, leapt from the car and run off into the forest about 45 minutes earlier. And unsurprisingly, the rest of my stomach's content had been pining to follow suit, I have to confess. Still... When, you're, when you partner up uh, with someone on these things, you kind of feel obliged to stick with your driving buddy. And part of me still figured that I could learn something. Boy, was I about to get a lesson. Actually, not me, but well, okay, here's what happened. We, we sat down to eat, and because it was Mr. LJK set right, Mercedes sent a senior suspension engineer to to come and eat with us it was like sending a lamb to the slaughter if, if i thought i'd been pranked that day it was nothing compared to what was about to happen to this poor guy see set right was one of the first technical motoring journalists he really knew his nuts and bolts which is kind of why he understood that the japanese were doing things better so he had knowledge experience, a reputation, a gravitas, and the ability to shut you down with a coolly delivered phrase so sharp it would literally slice you in half where you stood. Within 15 minutes, this senior Mercedes uh, engineer must have found himself 
not only doubting his abilities, but questioning his very life choices. Well, little old me, I was just playing hide and seek with the peas on my plate and wishing the ground would just open up and, and just swallow me because this was awkward. Oh my God. Anyway, I'll tell you what. Uh, I didn't stay for dessert. Dude, I just picked up some celebratory ladoos on the way home. Celebrating what? That I was still alive, innit? <laughs> anyway, nonetheless, I consider myself very fortunate to have shared time with a truly remarkable, impressive individual, an inspirational figure at the time, and now something of a legend. He passed away, I think, uh, only around five years after that, not at the wheel of a car, after all, but actually, uh, sadly, from treacherous cancer. May he rest in peace, but at full chat, because we know that's how he wants to go. Whoa, boy, did I go off on a whole damn tangent there? I'll tell you what, look, coming back to MME. Anyway, where was I? Okay, oh yeah, you started it. Well, okay, actually, uh, like I said, it was after I had gone to Dubai to be editor of Car Magazine, or more specifically, Car Middle East Magazine, because that was a dream come true for me. And I knew that I would never uh, get that opportunity here in the UK at the time. Actually, even today, let's be honest, because I have a name that places me somewhere in the Arabian Nights tales and a skin tone that suggests uh, to some uh, blighted by prejudicial preconceptions that my most uh, eloquent language abilities could most certainly only extend to a thousand apologies. <laughs> so instead, I went to wonderful UAE and I got to be editor of Car Magazine. Uh, oh, blimey. <laughs> and you know what? I poured my heart and soul into creating the best goddamn motoring magazine uh, the Middle East had ever seen. I, I raised the bar on car reviews, on drive features, on automotive photography, to standards that just had not been seen there before. I was initially flying UK car photographers over to Dubai to do feature shoots for me. <laughs> oh, then were the days when uh, magazine editors had budgets, eh? Uh, anyway, my personal remit was not to simply cut and paste the UK edition into the Middle East format. I wanted to uphold the quality style and groundbreaking ethos uh, and quality journalism of car, but with very much a local focus. I wanted to get into the local automotive mindset to understand the car culture and the lingo, and I wasted no time getting in with the community. Uh, this is what made my mag uh, authentically relatable to car enthusiasts in the region. I even kickstarted the cars and coffee style meats, although uh, probably actually more the cars and burgers style meats, because we held our first meet at a burger joint on Jumeirah Beach Road with 25 cars, ultimately growing to achieve uh, the biggest uh, car meet Dubai had ever seen at that point a few years later. Uh, but I've written about all of that before. Anyway, uh, when the contract for the car franchise was up, ITP, the publishers that I work for, decided not to renew it. Now, you might think that's odd. After all, I've just said that I created the best, most loved and well-read car magazine in the region ever. Well, here's where the crushing reality of publishing and media hit home and nearly put me off altogether. Yeah, readers love my magazines, my magazine, um, but advertisers didn't. Car advertisers specifically, probably because we were a little uh, too honest uh, uh, about our views on cars. Actually, what am I saying? A little too honest. I should just say honest. Actually, I should just say that we really did review cars rather than just, you know, republish press releases and, and brochures, which was kind of the thing at the time. So since advertising was hard to secure and the money from magazine sales didn't even cover the print cost, the publishers decided to stop the mag. Outcry, shock, sadness, disbelief, and that was just me. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, it was the readers too. I felt like I had been stabbed in the heart when a major Abu Dhabi newspaper ran the story with the headline, End of the Road for Car Middle East. Ouch. A story about a specific magazine being closed got into the news. ITP Senior Brass were taken aback, but we launch and kill titles all the time, most 
of the time no one even notices one of them complained to me yeah that's because your other titles don't have real and loyal readers that's because none of them are regarded as one of two of the best international franchise editions of a magazine as car middle east was and the other was car russia in fact and finally that's because you suck big time Actually, I didn't say any of that. Um, <laughs> I, I just nodded sadly. Uh, well, they were still paying my salary at the time. But as a send-off to the magazine, we decided to stage a final car Middle East car meet. Oh man, the, the, the turnout, the emotions, the love, the appreciation, the respect we got that evening. Yeah, it, it got a little hard to hold back the tears once or twice. And there was this one overriding message that kept coming through loud and clear. It can't end like this. You guys have got to carry on. So perhaps foolishly, we heard and we complied. Myself and my deputy editor on car, Emi Imtishan, uh, thus founded Motoring Middle East. So not because we wanted to, not because we thought it would be a good business idea, but because the car community wanted us to. And very soon, we abandoned our paid jobs to do it full time. Those were scary months. Those were these scary months. They, oh my God, what am I doing? How could I be so stupid? This is utterly crazy and foolhardy months. Actually, years. In fact, I'm still kind of in that phase uh, to a large extent, even now. Let me get back to that. So, motoring Middle East was a roller coaster ride. We had deep, frustrating, and painful lows, but the highs were sensational. We continued the car meets and, as I mentioned, broke records in meet attendance numbers. We ended up with a weekly radio slot on Dubai Eye, which was the leading talk show station uh, in the UAE. We hosted live stage shows at the Dubai Motor Show. We created groundbreaking, never done before video content for ourselves and for manufacturers and dealers over there. And I even ended up hosting a, a TV show on Fox TV for the whole Middle East region. We developed a following that meant we'd be recognized and Asked for selfies and autographs whenever we were out and about. Anyway, I left Motoring Middle East uh, and returned to the UK at the end of 2018. But Imtishan continues to take the brand forward and part of me will forever be Motoring Middle East. A huge achievement of which I will always be proud and that's kind of why I wanted to mark its ninth birthday. But part of me will always also be Car Middle East magazine before that that was my baby and part of me will always be in the glossy relaunch of used car buyer magazine here in the uk in the early 2000s which we did which was brilliant and part of me will be in the award-winning parker's website which i actually launched as editor as editor of the website uh, at the end of 1999 and we became the second biggest uh, british automotive website after auto trader within a few months and part of me will always be with the Saudi Gazette and the Arab News English newspapers in Saudi Arabia with which I started my career in motoring journalism and which also enabled me to claim the title of the kingdom's very first car journal. Some pretty awesome achievements if I say so myself. Despite not always getting the easiest and best breaks in life because of being the wicked wazir's desi cousin while trying to Pave my path in an era that bridged the era of the National Front and 9-11. I'm referring to the Twin Towers attack, not the Porsche. You get what I'm saying, right? But whilst I love looking back, I do relish looking forward even more. Even if I'm back to those scary months and still find myself up against the same kind of odds that I encountered 30 years ago when I returned back to the UK from Saudi Arabia. Seriously, how have we not managed to progress? Why am I still fighting against a tidal wave of whiteness that ain't so fair, after all, if you see where I'm coming from? And uh, now I'm the brown car guy, my very own brand. Why the brown car guy? Because simplicity works in a digital world and it's a literal interpretation of what I am. No, no, no. I, I, I don't mean I have a brown car. Duh. <laughs> I, I, I'm brown and I'm a car guy, hence I'm the brown car guy. Yeah, it is a confirmation of being proud of my distinct identity and it is kind of in outright defiance of convention. Perhaps I did learn something from Set Right after all, eh? What a hero. Anyway, 
I'm also part of MotorOverload.com, which I've co-founded with my dear friend Kevin Haggerty, who is a highly experienced motoring journalist, but also one of the most skilled and talented uh, drivers that I know, and, and I don't mean like set right. <laughs> anyway, exciting, anxious days ahead that could turn out to be deeply rewarding or utterly disastrous. I know what I'm capable of, so the rest is down to you. No, 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 don't look over your shoulder. I don't mean the other guy this time. I do mean you. Are you with me? If you are, let's do this. Cool. And if you are, make sure that you're subscribing to youtube.com forward slash brown car guy make sure you follow me on all the social media channels just search for hashtag brown car guy.com on instagram twitter and facebook and of course subscribe to brown car guy.com if you enjoy my content if you enjoy my videos and if you are with me if you're with the brown car guy and you would like to support me then go to patreon.com forward slash shazad shake and there you can also find some exclusive content and maybe some goodies like this hat anyway even if you can't do that please continue to like comment share subscribe and all the rest of it that's much appreciated and is really really useful for me so thank you so much uh, for taking the time to watch this extended video hope you enjoyed that let me know what you thought of what I've been talking about. Put it in the comments above below elsewhere. I'd love to hear your opinions and your feedback on this video. And I will see you again soon in the next one.